Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life.
This morning, we're going to pull back the curtain and take a look into really one of the most uh, famous conversations in recorded history. This conversation is between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, but uh, not not just any Pharisee. He, He was a Pharisee who was so capable so highly regarded that, that he served on the Sanhedrin, which was the, the Jewish ruling council, basically like a religious supreme court. So in other words, Nicodemus was kind of a big deal. People knew him. He was very important. And he wanted to talk with Jesus. So one night, uh, under the cover of darkness, Nicodemus tracks Jesus down to talk. And their conversation includes one of the most famous things that Jesus ever said. Uh, We find it in John chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. So what what was behind this? What what was it that led up to this conversation that that drove a, a Pharisee like Nicodemus to want to talk to Jesus? And what was their conversation like? Well, it might have gone something like this. It was night. And Nicodemus kept to the shadows as he went to find the master teacher. Along the way, his mind was replaying all the events that had led up to this clandestine meeting. It started with the wilderness preacher, John, the baptizer. Crowds of people went out there to hear him speak. So, Of course, the Supreme Ruling Council was going to vet him. I mean, part of the council's job was to make sure that guys like the baptizer, you know, who just sort of randomly show up out of the blue like this, it's their job to make sure that guys like this weren't leading people astray. It was a job that Nicodemus and the whole council took very seriously. So the council sent some people out there in the wilderness to see for themselves just what exactly was going on. And they asked the baptizer for his credentials. He told them, well, I'm not the Messiah, if that's what you're asking. So what then? Are you Elijah, who's come again? (laughs) No, hardly. Are you the prophet? (sighs) No, I'm not. Then who are you? I'll tell you who I am. I am the wilderness voice. Calling people, calling you and that nest of snakes who sent you to prepare yourselves for the coming of the Lord. The council members said, well, if you're not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, then then who do you think you are coming out here like this, baptizing people? John said, listen, you don't need to worry about me. I'm only out here baptizing with water. You need to worry about the one who's coming. You have no idea. But I'll tell you this, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Now, when the messengers reported back to the council, to to most of the council members, this baptizer was just some random nobody who was spouting off about nothing. But to Nicodemus, this grabbed his attention with both hands. Prepare yourselves for the coming of the Lord, the the one who's coming. Uh, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Nicodemus thought a lot about what this wilderness preacher said. Who was he talking about, the the one who's coming? Could it actually be the anointed one, the Messiah? Well, the council dismissed it. But for Nicodemus, these questions roiled like lava in his gut. The things really started to get heated up when the council got their next report from the wilderness because evidently the one that John the baptizer said was coming showed up. 
His name was Jesus. No one knew anything about him except he was from way up north in Nazareth, just a little backwater town in the middle of nowhere. And the council member giving the report said, now don't shoot the messenger, okay, but the baptizer is telling everyone that this Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God and, and that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and now people are leaving the baptizer to follow Jesus. And Jesus is, well, he's, he's formally calling apprentice learners. And they're following him. And, and they're calling Jesus their master teacher. Master teacher, the high priest said. Who is Jesus studied under? The report giver said, I don't know. Nobody knows. I actually don't think he's studied under anyone. And he's calling apprentice learners? Who does he think he is? Well, that's what Nicodemus wanted to find out. Because Jesus was going to be trouble. He could feel it. But what if Jesus was also the Messiah? Nicodemus wanted to find out for himself, but it's not like someone in his position who's a senior member of the Supreme Ruling Council that they could just be seen in public with someone like Jesus. It would be viewed as an endorsement of him. And Nicodemus certainly wasn't willing to do that. So for now, anyway, Nicodemus would just have to wait and see. Which was fine. Until the whole Passover debacle. Now the council always meets during Passover. And during their Passover meeting, a messenger ran into the council chamber all out of breath. <sighs> There's, there's, a, there's a riot in the temple courtyard. Some lunatic is whipping all the merchants and the money changers, is flipping their tables over, running them out of the temple. There's money all over the place, and, and the livestock are loose. And, and the crazy men just keep shouting, stop making my father's house into a shopping market. Someone said, do we know who's doing this? The messenger said, don't shoot the messenger, okay? But it, it's Jesus. Uh-oh, Nicodemus thought. Oh, he's trouble, all right. But that doesn't mean he's not the Messiah. So the council sent a group down to the temple right away, and they found Jesus still there in the temple court, He's sitting down and talking to a crowd of people who were surrounding him. And one of the council members just rudely pushes his way through the crowd and walked right up to Jesus, and he says, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to tear the temple apart like this? And Jesus looked at him, and he said, eh, go ahead and destroy this whole temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. The council member nearly spit. <laughs> you are crazy. It took Herod 46 years to build this temple. How are you going to do it in three days? And he shook his head and left with the others to report this to the council. But when Nicodemus heard the report from the whole temple situation, he still had no idea who Jesus was. But he decided that it was time to find out. And I think Nicodemus had known other self-professed messiahs, and Jesus didn't sound like any of them. Truth is, Jesus didn't sound like anyone Nicodemus had ever heard. And that's not even to mention all the reports of his miracles. So many healings. And whenever Nicodemus heard about another one of Jesus' supposed healings, he always thought of what the prophet Isaiah said that would happen when the Messiah comes. And the eyes of those who are blind will be opened. The ears 
of those who can't hear will be unplugged. And those who can't walk will leap like deer. And those who can't speak will shout for joy. Nicodemus had heard reports of all these things. Blind people who see, deaf people who hear, lame people who walk, speechless people who talk. And that, along with all of the really strange but very intriguing things that, that Jesus did and said, well, that's the reason that Nicodemus was on his way in the dark of night to finally meet with Jesus in person. He was eager to hear what Jesus had to say for himself, but for the sake of his reputation, he refused to be seen talking to him in public or, or even in broad daylight. So he waited for nightfall and kept to the shadows as he made his way to the place where he was told he would find Jesus. He found him there, Jesus, sitting by a roaring campfire, talking with a small group of people, no doubt his apprentice learners. And they all looked up as Nicodemus approached the fire. No one said a word, but, but you could read it in their faces. What in the world is a member of the Supreme Ruling Council doing here at this time of night? And Nicodemus felt their surprise, and he understood it. And after a long moment of awkward silence, Nicodemus pointed to an open space around the fire, and he said, may I? And Jesus smiled warmly, and he gestured toward the same spot, and he said, please sit. You're welcome to join us. Nicodemus sat down facing Jesus. Everybody else already sitting around the fire just stared at him. More awkward silence. And finally, Nicodemus said, Master teacher, it's obvious that you've been sent by God. No one could perform the kinds of miraculous signs that you have with, well, unless God is with them. More silence. Then Jesus said, You're right. So let me give it to you straight. Unless someone is born again from above, they will never see what my miraculous signs are pointing to, to the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was baffled by this, and his face showed it. He, he didn't have the first clue what Jesus was talking about. What did he mean, born again from above? And Nicodemus shrugged. How can an old man like me be born? I mean, it's not like I can just crawl back into my mother's womb and be birthed all over again. Jesus took his time before answering. <laughs> Let me give it to you straight once again. Unless someone is born of water and spirit... They will never belong to God's kingdom. Just like how people give birth to people, the spirit gives birth to spirit. So don't be shocked that I told you that you must be born again from above. Look, you know how the wind blows wherever it wants and you can hear it blowing, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going? Well, that's how it is for everyone who's born from the Spirit. Nicodemus was now even more confused than before. What are you talking about? Jesus said, if you don't know what I'm talking about, how could you call yourself one of Israel's teachers? Nicodemus said nothing. Jesus went on. Let me give it to you straight one last time. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, I've seen it with my own two eyes. I've personally experienced it. This is not secondhand information. 
This is not hearsay. This is reliable testimony. But you and the rest of your council don't believe me. Instead of taking the miraculous evidence and signs seriously, instead of accepting it, instead of taking me seriously and believing me, you all just keep harassing me with all your ridiculous questions and accusations. So here's the deal. If you're not going to take me seriously when I tell you things that are as plain as day, well, you're never going to believe me when I tell you about the kinds of things that you can't see, the heavenly things of God. You really should take me seriously, though, because no one else has gone up into heaven, into God's heavenly presence, except the one who came down from God's heavenly presence, the Son of Man. And you really should believe me. Because just like way, way back when, in Moses' day, when, when Moses lifted up that bronze snake in the wilderness so the people could have something to look to and believe in, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who looks to him and believes in him will have eternal life. Bronze snake in the wilderness. Finally, something Nicodemus understood. He knew the story well from the book of Numbers. He had read this more times than he could probably count. <coughs> God's people were wandering in the wilderness, but God remained faithful to them, providing food and water and protection and, and guidance. And how do the people respond? Well, what do the people do in response to God's faithfulness to them? They whine and they moan and they complain. They gripe about God. They, they bellyache about Moses. Why did you bring us all the way out here in the desert to die? We should have stayed in Egypt. There's no bread here. There's no water. And the food we have, the food you gave us, is awful. Ugh. We're sick of it. We, we hate this miserable, worthless food. And all of a sudden, in the middle of, of this nationwide temper tantrum, snakes are coming out of the woodwork. Venomous snakes slithering all over the place, striking, biting anyone they could reach. And the people are like, snakes? Why did it have to be snakes? And, and so they run to Moses for help. They ask Moses to help them, and they say they're so, so sorry, and, and, and they really didn't mean it. And would Moses please, please ask God to make the snakes go away? And so Moses does. He prays for God to help, and then, and then God says, fine, Moses, make a bronze statue of a snake and, and put it on a pole and lift it up in front of the people who are dying all around you. And as soon as you lift that up, if the people will just look at the snake, they'll live. So Moses makes the bronze snake, and he lifts it up on a pole so the people can see it and believe, and it works. Everyone who looks up at the bronze snake is healed and saved. They didn't have to make a, a, a sacrifice or bring a special offering to the tabernacle. They didn't have to go see a priest and, and ask for forgiveness. They don't have to do anything. Just look at the bronze snake on the pole, and you'll live. Nicodemus always loved that story because of how God took a symbol of death and transformed it into a source of life. All you had to do to live was to look and believe. Jesus leaned forward and looked intently into Nicodemus's eyes. And he said, just as Moses lifted up that bronze snake in the wilderness so the people could have something to look to and believe in, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who looks to him 
and believes in him will have eternal life. That, Jesus said, that is how God loved the world. God wanted to show his love to the world, so he gave the world his son, his one and only son. And make no mistake, God did not give his son to condemn the world. No, God gave his son to save the world. Nicodemus went back home that night in the dark, more ways than one. But his mind was swirling with thoughts of invisible spirit winds blowing and bronze snakes being lifted up. And especially, especially thoughts about old men being reborn. But as for who Jesus was, He didn't know. Could he be the long-awaited Messiah, God's true anointed one? Nicodemus couldn't say, but there was something about Jesus, something easy and plain spoken about him, but, but also something elusive and hard to pin down. And there was something that drew you to him, but yet also made him hard to grasp. There was something so comforting about him, and yet something quite unnerving. Something so familiar, and yet there, there, there was a true otherness about him. It was something that made Jesus unlike anyone Nicodemus had ever met. But that something, whatever it was, that something gave Nicodemus hope. Hope that God's Messiah may have actually come to save the world. Now, when Jesus said this, when, when he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the, in the wilderness, so, that, so, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. When Jesus says this, that the Son of Man must be lifted up, Jesus is comparing himself to the snake on the pole. And so if you were back in Numbers 21 and, and you're dying from a snake bite, the only way to live is to do what? It, it is to look, right? It is to look at the bronze snake, look at a symbol of suffering and death. God told Moses to take a symbol of suffering and death and lift it up so that everyone who looks at that symbol of suffering and death will be saved. So now fast forward to the New Testament and God says, I'm going to give my son, my one and only son, and I'm going to lift him up, up on a cross. Lift him up on a symbol of suffering and death so that anyone and everyone who looks at him will be saved. Now this, I mean, yes, absolutely. The snake on the pole back in Moses' day, that was really something. It was, but this, seriously, this is so much more, so much more than a snake on a pole. This is the Son of God lifted up on a cross, the Son of God on a cross, this is the ultimate symbol of suffering and death becoming, being transformed into the ultimate source of life for sinners. Simply look to Jesus, the Son of God, suffering and dying on the cross, and you will be saved. All you do is look and believe. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how shocking and terrible your sin is, no matter how long you've been living with these sins, no matter what. I mean, even if you've never gone to church or have ever even thought of yourself as remotely religious, all you have to do is look at Jesus, lift it up on the cross, and believe. Look and see that you are forgiven. 
Look and see that you are saved. Look and see that you do have eternal life. Look and believe. But, but don't just believe that it happened. I mean, it, it, it's more than that. <coughs> Even the demons believe that this happened. To believe means to, to, to come to the end of yourself and realize that you've been bitten by sin and, and the venom of sin is coursing through your veins. And your only hope of being healed, cured, and saved from this is by looking to Jesus. Believing means betting everything on Jesus as the only one who can save you from sin, death, and the power of hell. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Now, we don't know how Nicodemus responded to this that night. We, we, we don't know exactly what he was thinking. We, we, we don't know uh, what he might have said, or we don't know what, what he might have done after he talked to Jesus. We don't know any of that. But there is something we do know about him. It's at the end of the Gospel of John, chapter 19, which, which just so happens to be the day that Jesus was lifted up to suffer and die on the cross. So let me read it for you. John chapter 19, starting verse 38. Later, after Jesus had died, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. And with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Joseph was accompanied by guess who? Accompanied by Nicodemus, a man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought with him a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and taking Jesus' body down from the cross. The two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And they, Joseph and Nicodemus, laid Jesus there. You know what this looks like to me? This looks like Nicodemus believed. This looks like Nicodemus believed the words that Jesus told him in John 3, that the Son of Man must be lifted up like the bronze snake in the wilderness. This looks like Nicodemus believed that God showed his love to the world when he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It looks like Nicodemus believed after all. That's what this looks like to me. But what does all this look like to you? Do you see Jesus lifted up on the cross for you? Do you believe? Do you believe that your sins are forgiven and you are promised eternal life? Do you believe? Because from the very first soft cry in the manger to the final agonizing cry on the cross. God was saying something to all the devils and all the demons and to even death itself. God was saying that he would save the world no matter what it cost. God was saying that he would save you no matter what it cost. And what did it cost? God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. 
Do you believe? Do you believe? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we know that you are the Savior of the world. We do believe in you, but help our unbelief. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would strengthen the faith that you've given us and that you would also give us courage and extra strength in our trials and temptations. But when we do stumble, when we do fall, when we do sin, Lord, help us to truly believe that you did not come to condemn us, but to save us, to save us all. All our hope, all our trust is in you, both now and forever. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray all of this. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and, and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. You simply click, and you can spend more time uh, with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. Or you can visit triumphlbc.org events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would, would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.